Welcome to another great O'Reilly webcast. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's event. Today, folks, we have Leslie Hawthorne with us, and she's going to talk to you about civility, empathy, and women in tech. Leslie's an internationally known community manager, speaker, and author. She has spent the past decade creating, cultivating, and enabling open source communities. She created the world's first initiative to involve pre-university students in open source software. Launched Google's number two developer blog, received an O'Reilly Open Source Award in 2010, and gave a few great talks on many things open source. In August 2013, she joined Elasticsearch as community manager, where she leads developer relations. She works from the Elasticsearch's EU headquarters in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, when not out about gathering user praise and points. You can follow her adventures on Twitter, and she is at L. Hawthorne. Folks, we're really excited to have Leslie with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get the event started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. First, you'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Leslie. We find that our audiences usually have a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Leslie, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for her and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is OzCon, all one word. If you have any trouble with the webcast, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. If you have any choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know we are recording today's webcast and we will have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Leslie for her presentation. Hello, Leslie. Hi, Asmina. Thanks so much for that great introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on uh, where in the world you're joining from. Uh, once again, my name is Leslie Hawthorne, and this evening, for me at least, in Amsterdam, we'll be discussing civility, empathy, and women in technology. Uh, this presentation will consist of first setting the landscape so that we understand uh, who this talk is intended to be useful for, uh, an, an examination of the problems that we're facing and that we'll be discussing today, um, why these problems matter to you, the individual listener, and then we're going to dive into some useful strategies for creating empathy within ourselves and within our communities, and for creating and maintaining civil dialogues. Before we dive into the meat of this presentation, I thought it was very important to share with all of you why I, in particular, am giving this talk today. Uh, the first reason is because I am a stranger in a strange land. Uh, and those of you who are fans of Robert Heinlein may already recognize the artwork on this slide, uh, which is an adaptation of the cover art from his novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, I'm a stranger in a strange land because nine months ago, I moved from the west coast of the United States and took up permanent residency in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And it was amazing to me the degree of empathy that I developed very quickly because I was no longer a member of the dominant group. I'm an American and I'm living among the Dutch. And this is a culture that is not my culture and a set of systems that were not architected for my ease of participation. And I feel like I've developed a really strong understanding of what it's like on both sides of the fence, 
um, to be a member of a dominant group, and also to now understand what it's like to not be someone who has access to all of the uh, basically shortcuts within our social systems. And the second very important reason that I wanted to talk to everyone today about these topics was that I myself, for a very long time, didn't really understand what all the fuss was about around the concept of women in technology. I was a woman in tech. I felt like I was successful. I felt like I faced no barriers. And as a very wise friend of mine once told me, sexism doesn't exist until it happens to you. And it happened to me, and I began my journey of deeply engaging with these topics. But I think it's very important to realize that if I, someone who is impacted by the topics that we will discuss today, didn't understand the importance of these topics at one point in time, it's going to be very difficult for people who are less impacted to understand them at all. So my goal here today is to share with you my experiences and my learning so that together we can begin to cultivate that empathy and reinforce that civil dialogue. As with all presentations, it's important to start with uh, the important disclaimers. Um, first of all, the usual, these thoughts are mine, not of any past, present, or future employer. Um, it's also very important to emphasize to you that these thoughts are mine, and I speak only for myself. I speak for Leslie Hawthorne. I can't speak for all women in technology. I can't speak for people of color. I cannot speak for people who are not sighted. I cannot speak for people who are disabled. I can only share with you my own experiences. I also want to uh, take the opportunity to let the audience know that there is a trigger warning that some of this material uh, may bring back feelings of um, fear or anxiety or other stronger reactions, depending on what your past experiences have been, um, both for the material in this presentation and during our open Q&A. And last but not least, I sincerely hope that this talk leaves you feeling a bit peeved, uh, because if it doesn't, then I haven't done my job exploring these issues effectively enough. So a bit about our audience, who this talk is for. Um, <clears throat> this talk is for folks who are new to exploring these topics or newer to exploring some of these topics around women in technology. If you are already familiar with terms like intersectionality or uh, gaslighting or derailing, uh, it's likely that there is not a lot of material in this presentation that will be new for you. Um, and for those who find those terms completely unfamiliar, that's okay. There's a resources section at the end of the talk. This talk is also not going to be particularly useful for people who are uh, done with engaging in conversations to mentor and educate people who are early on in the path of understanding uh, the, the issues surrounding women in technology or other underrepresented groups in technology. Um, if, you're, if you've done your time educating folks and you're past that, that's okay. Um, but again, not a likely a lot of new material here for you or things that you would find useful. Uh, and last but not least, if you've come to this presentation feeling like you are attending a meeting of the political correctness crowd, it's quite likely that there won't be anything useful for you here either. <clears throat> this talk is really for people who are genuinely invested in improving their collaboration and communication skills. And I think we fall into a wide range of buckets, for lack of a better term. Um, there are some people who genuinely don't understand what all the fuss is about, but they would like to learn. There are some people who recognize the importance of the discussions that are going on around women in technology, um, but they don't understand or see a place for themselves within those dialogues. Um, there are people who want to be better allies to women and to other underrepresented groups in technology, but they're scared of making mistakes, and so they don't quite know what to do. And this material in this presentation is meant to give them effective strategies for being useful allies. And again, to reiterate, 
The goal of this presentation is to give people useful information that will help them to be better teammates, better collaborators, better communicators, more self-aware, and better educated human beings in general. So an exploration of where we're at and why we find ourselves here at this webcast today, our story so far. Um, just looking at these references, which are very familiar to folks in the open source community, but for those who are not, maybe they are less familiar. The quick summary of what you're seeing here is a series of headlines over the past several years where the concept that technology is a hostile environment for women have really come to the fore and been explored in a wide variety of media outlets. Um, the reason that I was so inspired to start talking about these topics in addition to the experiences I've had of late was actually Sarah Sharp bringing to the fore the discussion about the Linux kernel mailing list and civility in the dialogue on that mailing list. For people who are not familiar with the Linux kernel mailing list, it's the mailing list that everyone communicates about when uh, making changes to the Linux kernel. And I have heard it charitably referred to as a place that you only enter wearing an asbestos uh, armor, suit of armor. So needless to say, the, the dialogue's pretty contentious and not always polite. And for a long time, that was simply unquestioned. Um, but Sarah, who is the, a kernel developer, actually brought to the fore that perhaps it was damaging the Linux project, that the dialogue within the project was so uncivil and unwelcoming. And lest we think that the technology field is the only field where these questions are being considered, as early as six months ago, the American Library Association began debating publicly whether or not they ought to have a code of conduct for their events and participation in their group. So this is not just an issue facing the world of technology. These are issues that are coming to the fore across all industries. And that was absolutely exemplified by a very recent part of our story, uh, the Yes All Women hashtag campaign. Um, I think most of us on the line here are probably familiar with it, but for those who are not, uh, the Yes All Women hashtag campaign came about on Twitter uh, on May 24th in response to the murders in Santa Barbara of several women who were specifically targeted uh, because they were women and their uh, assailant uh, felt that uh, he needed revenge because women had denied him affection. Um, this, uh, sorry, it's, these, these things are never fun to talk about, right? Um, I think that the most important thing that I took away from the Yes All Women hashtag campaign, which chronicled the different ways in which women are subjected to misogyny, either overt misogyny or the misogyny inherent in our social systems. And the key takeaway for me was actually a tweet that I found by a gentleman who's a friend of mine, and I wish I could find it still, where he said, men, Sometimes Twitter is just for listening. Remember that today. Hash, yes, all women. Um, yes, all women was an incredibly powerful movement to raise awareness and consciousness around the concepts of the way our social systems disempower women specifically and has led to a great deal more very productive dialogue, in my opinion, around how our social systems serve to be exclusionary to people who are not members of the dominant group. In this case, we're referring to white males. And I look at the Yes All Women campaign as a different kind of incarnation of another phrase that we hear very often when talking about the question of women te in technology. And that phrase is, check your privilege. Um, it's interesting because Quite often when I hear this phrase, it utterly shuts down dialogue. And I'll explore that concept a bit more in a moment. But before that, it's important to define privilege so that we all understand what we're talking about. And privilege, the easy way to think of it is stuff that you get that other people don't get because of who you are. 
these are uh, these are things that are innate. These are things that you do not choose. And these aspects or these qualities, these attributes, um, cause you to be a part of the normal or dominant group. And when someone says to another individual, check your privilege, I tend to think that what they're trying to do is explain to that individual that the statement that they have just made uh, doesn't really encapsulate the whole story. And I've actually had conversations with gentlemen friends of mine whom I'm very close to, and we will talk about issues surrounding women in technology, um, how women are paid less than men, how women are expected to uh, put in more hours in order to be considered successful, um, and a wide variety of other things. And by and large, my gentlemen friends will nod in agreement as we discuss all of these topics, and they will uh, really want to see the problem solved, and they will consider themselves to be great allies until the word privilege comes into the dialogue. Uh, with one very good friend, I literally had him shut down our dialogue by saying, I don't even want to talk about privilege which was really surprising to me since we'd been discussing topics uh, around women in technology and the obstacles that they face for two hours up until this point. But when I used the P word, that was the end of our dialogue. And I was really surprised. I thought that was an odd reaction. So I said, why, why is it that you don't want to discuss privilege? And his response was, when I hear check your privilege, that's always used as a way to tell me that my opinion is invalid because I am a white male, that it doesn't matter what I have to say and that I should just shut up. And again, that's certainly not my experience of being told to check my privilege. So I thought long and hard about why that was what my friend was hearing. And I think it boils down to something that is incredibly pervasive in the culture of technology, and that's the meritocracy myth. In the technical world, we like to think of ourselves as living in a meritocracy because if we work hard and we have the right ideas and we execute well, clearly we will be successful. And it's a really beautiful story. We all want to believe that if we simply work hard and have good ideas, that everything is going to go well for us. And the fact is the meritocracy myth is very useful to people who are successful because it allows them to feel like they are special, that they won, that they've really done something amazing. Because since everyone has started on a level playing field, they were the ones who got themselves further out and further ahead in the game just by virtue of their own hard work. And the problem is when we challenge the meritocracy myth, it can be difficult. People feel very defensive when that myth is challenged. They don't think of it as a myth. It's part of their ingrained understanding of the universe. But the fact is there are many, many types of privilege and that keep us from living in this wonderful uh, and idealized meritocracy. I think the, the easiest one to think of that impacts every single human being is simply a matter of time. Uh, it is actually a privilege to have time to do things like voluntarily work on software projects and make contributions to open source software and publish your code on GitHub. And if you lack that time, you're in a position where fewer employers may consider you attractive because you don't have a referenceable body of work. If you don't have the time to make those contributions and you are less likely to succeed in finding better employment, this impacts your future as an employee. And when we look at the concept of how much time people have to practice this software craft on a volunteer basis, uh, there's a lot of factors that play into that. Um, in particular for women, um, there's something that's known as the second shift. And what that means is that women will uh, come home from full-time employment, and they will be uh, doing the majority of the work around the house for the upkeep of the home. They will also spend more time on child rearing, 
and more time on caring for family members than their male counterparts. And this takes away their time to be able to do the work, which would show them to have been a successful member of this meritocracy. Uh, aside from the question of gender, there's also the question of economic means and privilege there. Uh, if you have to work two jobs, you're simply not going to have enough time to write code in your spare time. You won't have any spare time. And so when we think about the meritocracy myth and all of the privileges that we actually have that underpin the fact that this is a myth, then again, it's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to our, our identity and how we perceive the world. And the response to that challenge most often is, at least if you're a woman pointing out these issues, why are you so angry? Um, surely you're overestimating the problem. This is just your experience. And other phrases that only serve to silence the discussion, much in the way that people would say the phrase check your privilege silences the discussion. And I find this to be really problematic for a wide variety of reasons, not the least of which is it doesn't make any rational sense. Um, in the technology industry, we talk about the importance of passionate programmers and technologists truly loving and mastering their craft. Uh, we have Paul Graham telling us that the most important thing that we can do with our lives is to do what we love. And yet at the same time, we're leaving out room for people to have other emotions, just like passion, just like love, and we're, we're saying to them that there is no space for them to have anger, and that doesn't actually uh, map to human reality. If we have passion, we will just as likely have anger or sadness or any other human emotion. And this response about why are you so angry, I think, has nothing to do with really necessarily trying to assess someone's emotional state. It's about the response to the phrase, check your privilege. And I think it's because what people hear is not, I think there's a problem with the way that things really are, and you are a participant in that flawed system. I think what they're hearing is, you are an awful person. You do bad things. And the fact of the matter is, it may be that that's what someone is saying to you. Um, I think frequently it is not. I think frequently someone is pointing out that you are a participant in a flawed system. But more importantly, it's very, very clear that human beings don't learn effectively from being punished. And if you feel as though someone is approaching you to punish you for bad behavior, you're not going to learn about how you are a participant in a flawed system and how you as an active participant within that flawed system can help to make things better for yourself and for everyone else. So we're gonna head into uh, understanding uh, your own privileges and, and kind of how to unpack those and how they operate. But first and foremost, I wanted to take the opportunity to give you guys a live demo where I unpack my own privilege and examine my own privileges uh, because I would never want to ask anything of anyone that I'm not willing to do myself. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of points here um, because my privileges are many and for them I am grateful. Um, but first and foremost, I am a wh I'm white, which means um, at, certainly during my time in the United States, I didn't have to worry about um, routine traffic stops being dangerous for me and for my health. Um, I didn't have to worry that people would automatically assume that because uh, I, I was walking around a store uh, that I was going to commit theft. Um, I am cisgendered, which means that my gender identity matches the sex that I was assigned at birth. Um, I'm a heterosexual, which means that I don't ever have to be afraid that when my partner and I go out for a meal, and kiss and hug that someone will uh, make noises of disgust or even potentially harm us after we leave the restaurant together. Um, I'm well-educated, 
and I had access to a computer basically from birth. Um, and this is not a privilege that other people enjoy. Uh, my school had a computer lab in the in like 1983, which was pretty much unheard of. And this means that I have constantly been absorbed in the technical world, and so therefore my ability to learn and grow within it has been that much easier because I was born into it. So I've unpacked my privilege a bit, and I hope that I've inspired you to do the same. So I've personalized it for me. Let's talk about why this matters to you, the individual. So I would like to believe that it would simply be sufficient to say to everyone, this matters to you because we want to live in a just world, and so therefore these are matters of justice, and so we should all work hard to achieve justice for everyone. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the concept of justice is so subjective and individual that that's not an effective argument for me to make. So I'm going to focus on some topics that are, that are very measurable and very immediate uh, and not subjective. Uh, item number one, uh, creating an inclusive environment dramatically affects your bottom line. Uh, more diverse teams uh, have bit, are mem uh, the businesses that employ more diverse teams have increased sales revenue, greater numbers of customers, better market share, and greater profits relative to their competitors. And it has been consistently shown by studies in the workplace that more diverse teams are more creative and more stimulated because of their consistent exposure to minority perspectives. Basically, simply put, if we create a diverse work environment, we're able to build better products more successfully and make more money simply by virtue of the fact that we are benefiting from a wide variety of perspectives, and those wide variety of perspectives make the things that we build that much better and that much more applicable to more of our customers' lives. So, Next reason this matters to you. I'm gonna go ahead and push a quick poll to everyone. Um, actually two, my first poll is whether or not your company is hiring. So real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and put this out and give people a couple of seconds to go ahead and answer and then I'll take a look at the results. Excellent. Thanks very much, everyone, for responding so quickly. So at this stage, just for the folks on the line here, 62.8% of the participants in this webinar are at companies who are currently looking to hire technical talent. So my next follow-up question to that is, for those of you who have been looking to hire technical talent, how long have your positions been open? And I'll give folks couple moments to respond to that as well. Wow, excellent, okay. So 100% of our respondents say that these positions have been open for three to six months. Good data point. Um, in my experience, that's actually a little bit low, um, but again, everyone's mileage varies based on their experience. So if you consider that it is extremely hard to hire technical talent. Folks, there's a three to six month window for someone to come on board at your organization, and 63% of us are looking to hire right now. That means that if we're creating practices within the technical community that exclude people because they are not members of the dominant group, we are cutting ourselves off from a huge supply of talent. And that means that that talent will go elsewhere potentially to one of our competitors. And if you look at just even one simple cross-section to, to magnify this point, um, in my world, data science is very important. And an article by uh, the Wall Street Journal in February of this year, so, so very short time ago, pointed out that we are at an 80% gap between the required numbers of data scientists and the pool of graduates coming out from university now. So we are at an absolute dearth of technical talent. And those of us who have been in the industry for a long time know that we seem to find ourselves continuously lacking technical talent. 
So if we want to make sure that we're able to fill those open positions, bring our products to market faster, and not exhaust ourselves and our teams while we're waiting to hire that next individual, we need to make sure that we're creating cultures that are inclusive so that those folks join us and help us succeed. I think the greatest loss that's experienced by creating cultures that are not inclusive is productivity. And this is a difficult one because it's very hard to measure. And it's also very difficult because more often than not, we're uh, hurting our colleagues' productivity and we're not even realizing that we're doing it. Um, let me give you one excellent example from my own life. A few years ago, I was working very hard on a documentation project with a male colleague, and this was all new. It was a brand new uh, thing. We were really excited to get it out there. Our customers really needed it, and weeks were spent working on this problem. And we were putting just you know putting the finishing touches on it, just getting ready to publish. And we were all in our uh, team chat room, making sure that uh, everything was ready to go. And I said, "Yep." I think we're ready to go, let's go ahead and publish. And then my male colleague said, published. And our manager's immediate response was to say, great job, male colleague's name. Now, I don't think that that was malicious or malevolent. I think he just made a mistake. Uh, I think he just made a mistake that many men are socialized to make, which is to discount women's contributions. Um, and we can get into how that stuff is socialized during the Q&A. But the fact of the matter was, frankly, I usually try to ignore things like that because I assume ignorance and not malice. But this time I couldn't. I just, I lacked patience. I was done. My energy reserves were low. And I was extremely frustrated and upset. And instead of getting anything done for the next couple of hours, I was just really angry and didn't do anything. Uh, and I was utterly demotivated and didn't want to do the work that I was doing, didn't want to get on to my next project, even though I'd been really excited about it, simply because of this interaction. And, you know, again, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you remind yourself that it is ignorance and not malice. But the fact of the matter is, even taking the time to remind yourself that something that your colleague has done that seems disrespectful to you, and that is something that you, have, that you experience more frequently as a member of the non-dominant group, as a woman, requires energy. That requires cycles. And those cycles could be better spent collaborating with our teammates, building better products, and working on more projects. That story that I just told you is an example of a microaggression. A microaggression is a small thing that happens in our everyday uh, interactions. It's usually something that we tend to take for granted. And these microaggressions, uh, on the individual you know, level, eh, they're probably not that big of a deal. But when you add them up cumulatively over time, they become extremely difficult to deal with. They sap our energy. They take our cycles. They make participating in the things that we once loved that much less exciting and useful to us. And again, remember, these are happening not because someone is malicious, but because they are acting in the way that we all take for granted within a flawed system. My favorite example of a microaggression is uh, a story from my childhood with a really good friend of mine from church. Her name was Adonis Williams. Uh, and she, uh, she was a figure skater and she was a black girl using the word that she used to define herself. And she and I used to have blasts uh, playing around out in my backyard. And one day she was over visiting me, and she skinned her knee. And I thought, oh, well, that's not so great. So I went into the house to get her a bandage. And I came back, and I handed her the bandage, and she put it over the cut, and everything was fine. But, but I looked at her, and I looked at this, this pink piece of plastic against her mocha-colored skin, and it didn't look right to me. I couldn't understand why that, was, that just wasn't right. So I apologized to her, and I said, Adonis, I'm really sorry the next time that you come and visit me, I'll get Band-Aids for you. And this was when she told me that they didn't make Band-Aids for her. And this was my first understanding of racism. 
And this was my first understanding that we live in a world that is constructed in ways that we tend to take for granted to not be useful or welcoming to people who are not like us or not like members of the dominant group. Uh, and lest anyone think that uh, this is not a hot topic, it is merely from the annals of my memory, sharing with you a URL here from The Atlantic. And this same story about the lack of bandages for people of color, specifically for black people, was written about just a year ago. So this is, this is, not, a, this is not a new problem. So in order to prevent these times when we may commit microaggressions against our colleagues, we need to understand bias and what bias is. And bias, as defined, is the human tendency to make systematic decisions in certain circumstances based on cognitive factors rather than on evidence. Uh, the most common bias we typically see is cognitive bias. And what that means is the privileging or the overemphasis of the importance of our own experience versus a, a wider set of factual evidence. So a great example of this would be clearly there is no problem with women in technology. I work with six women programmers, so everything must be great. When we look at the rest of the statistics industry-wide and see that women make up approximately 15% of those in technical professions. Biases are an innate part of being a human being. Um, people are just naturally tend to select their friends and their partners and people that they hang out with because we share common interests and goals. We are like-minded. Um, and we train each other in our interactions to adopt one another's biases because, again, people tend to group together with people who are like them, and we tend to reinforce one another's opinions. So the key takeaway here is that biases are socialized, they are unconscious, they are not uh, maliciousness, they are simply a part of being a human being, but they are in constant operation. So how do we, once we understand that we have bias, how do we address that? Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, it's extremely hard work. It's very, very hard work. Um, simply the process of going through and understanding what your biases may be and going through a process of self-reflection and increased self-awareness in and of itself is, is difficult to do. Um, and it's really hard then once we have an understanding of what our biases are to actually overcome them uh, for a variety of reasons. So the first one is that we're really uncomfortable that we're biased. Uh, we are smart people. We tend to think of people who have biases as being ignorant or un uneducated. We tend to think of people who are biased uh, as being bad people. They hold, uh, they hold bad beliefs. They don't treat each other, treat other people with respect, and that, that is not us. Um, and again, this makes us uncomfortable realizing that we aren't quite the person that we thought we were, realizing that we do have these biases, realizing that we are not perfect which is never comfortable. Um, then there's the fact that bias is just a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. It's a part of our experience. And so trying to give up and address that bias means giving up a part of ourselves. And our biases are something that we want to keep, that they're important to us. So for example, I am biased in favor of open source software. I've been working with open source software and open source communities for almost a decade. Um, and if someone came to me and said, well, you're clearly biased in favor of open source software, I would have to say yes, and I think it's very important for all of these reasons. Just like our other biases tend to be very useful to us and something that we want to maintain because we have thought about this problem sometimes, and we formed a conclusion that we think is rational sometimes, rarely in the case of cognitive bias. So this whole process is going to be very difficult, um, and that's okay, right? The fact of the matter is here, the point is to be uncomfortable. Um, this is never going to be an easy process, and it is okay for it to be uncomfortable. And this is something that I can't emphasize to folks enough when talking about that, that discomfort and the, 
particularly at the start of our journey of self-awareness and, and understanding our biases and understanding how we may hold privilege. Um, discomfort means that we're learning. Uh, as technologists, we have books that tell us that we can learn programming languages the hard way. Um, we, it is well known that it takes 10,000 hours of practice uh, to have mastery over any particular task. Um, but when it comes to questions around uh, gender and race and uh, physical ability, we tend to be very uncomfortable addressing those topics and understanding our biases around them. It's extremely uncomfortable. And the fact is, as with anything, learning is uncomfortable. That discomfort that we feel when we look at these topics means that we are learning something. And that's an incredibly positive and important thing to do. That is the most important reason why examining these topics is important to you, the individual. It's your opportunity to learn. So how do we get started? If we really want to go down this journey and be a better uh, colleague and a better uh, ally to our friends who are members of underrepresented groups like women in technology, so uh, first and foremost is ask your friends. And I'm not suggesting to you that you uh, run out and say, hey, you're not like me. Do you want to be my friend? Because I want to learn things from you. Um, because that pathway will not meet with success. But it is useful to talk to your friends who you know are uh, interested in topics like this and ask them for their opinion, ask them for their feedback, ask them for their wisdom. And it's important here to start with people who are close to you. Right? Because, uh, again, these are uncomfortable topics, and you want to explore them with people with whom you are comfortable so that you are able to learn and move forward. Um, there are some resources at the end of this presentation that are a great start as well. And for those who may not have a diverse set of friends, and that is, in fact, why you're here today, a great tool to use as you're first getting started here is Twitter, and to simply use Twitter as a listening tool. And follow people on Twitter who are not like you in one way or another, but who talk about topics that are really important to you. Um, I follow several uh, African-American female technologists, and I have learned so much from their perspective, and I have learned so much from their experience just by listening and reading their experiences. And what I have learned and the, the way, the degree to which my own understanding and perspective has been broadened by those interactions is something that I can't articulate very effectively, um, but it's been profound. So I would absolutely suggest that as a path forward to anyone who is attending this webinar today. Another important aspect of being a good ally is uh, how to ask questions the smart way, which is a, a phrase that's very familiar to folks from the open source software world. So if you are uh, interacting with someone who is a uh, I'm not a member of the dominant group, and you are a member of the dominant group, or just in general with someone who is, who is not like you in one way or another, um, understand that there are some questions that are, are just wholly inappropriate and are not gracious. And a good rule of thumb is how would you feel if this question was asked to you? So, for example, if someone come up, came up to me and said, so, Leslie, what is it like being a heterosexual? I, I would think that question was pretty weird. Um, so then, therefore, perhaps I would not want to ask someone what it was like, hey, what's it like to be gay? It's, it's probably the least interesting thing about them, to be perfectly honest. Um, if you're asking for education around what it is like to be a person who is not a member of the dominant group, this can be a very difficult uh, conversation to have, not simply because you yourself, the asker, are uncomfortable, but because the person that you're communicating with is in the extremely difficult position of not only needing to spend the extra cycles required to be a participant in a system where they are not a member of the dominant group, but then they're also being asked to provide cycles to you to teach you more things. And that is an exhausting process, and it is very tiring, and it requires cycles, and it also requires you, someone who is personally impacted by these topics, to re-experience all the ways in which they impact you, and that can be problematic and difficult. So if you are going to ask an individual for more information uh, and guidance about where you can learn more, 
either from them or otherwise, it's really important to, to make it clear that you respect if they don't want to have this dialogue with you and that you would welcome the opportunity for a pointer to additional resources because you value their feedback. But if someone doesn't want to answer your questions or take time to educate you and suggest that perhaps you might wish to visit the internet, that's okay. Remember the metaphor that white males are playing on the lowest possible difficulty setting, whereas other people are playing on progressively more and more difficult difficulty settings, taking a metaphor from the gaming world. And again, if, uh, if they're busy fighting off monsters that you don't see because of your lowest difficulty setting, they're not necessarily going to have energy to answer your questions about the map. And going back to our earlier topic of anger, um, there are people who are genuinely angry. Um, there are people who are not going to want to have a polite, nice dialogue with you because these topics are so close to their hearts. Um, and they do impact them so severely. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I don't get angry about a lot of the stuff we've talked about today on a regular basis. Um, and it's, again, it's okay to be angry. But if you're in a dialogue with someone and you feel like they're angry and you don't know how to deal with it, especially now that you are in a place where you want to be respectful of the experiences they've had and the background that they come to the table with, um, it's really important in your, you know, approach them with respect. You know, I understand that these topics are real problems and I understand that they impact you in ways that I will never understand. Um, my goal here is to learn from you and engage in dialogue with you and come to better understanding. And I feel like you're angry and I feel like you're angry with me. And I can respect that, but if you're angry with me, I would want some specific feedback on how to improve. And if you're angry at the situation, I understand, but I'd like to return to you at a time when that's past because I'm not able to absorb any of the information that you're giving me when you're angry. And it's okay to make those statements. It's okay to walk away from a conversation that you don't feel is productive. But at the same time, that doesn't alleviate that, uh, I would say, responsibility to learn and to learn from another resource. And it is also okay to set your boundaries and say that you feel like the topic and the dialogue is very angry. And again, it's okay for people to be angry, but you don't have to spend any time with them, nor do you have to spend any energy explaining to them why they're angry and explaining to them why that is bad. Simply move along. The most important aspect to being a good ally and, and you know, building up that ability to support others and our colleagues who are members of underrepresented groups is first and foremost to be self-aware. Uh, we talked a bit about understanding our biases and how we came to have them, but it's not in only significant to understand what your biases are. It's also very important to understand how they impact your thinking and your actions. So if my colleague comes into work and I say to him, hey, you know, how was your weekend? Did you and your girlfriend do anything fun? I should be self-aware and realize that I think of relationships as heterosexual relationships because I am a heterosexual and that is the map for me. Maybe he doesn't have a girlfriend. Maybe he has a boyfriend. Maybe he has two boyfriends. Who knows? What are the assumptions that we bring to the table? How do they impact our actions? How do they impact our dialogue? How can they make people feel unwelcome when that was never our goal? And how can we change our phrasing and change our approach to ensure that people around us do feel welcome, do feel included, and do feel like they as individuals and their individual experience is valued by us. My, my favorite way to tell people to ensure that that happens is to practice mass affirmation and wide welcoming. And what that means is be appreciative, be verbally appreciative of everyone around you for their contributions to your experience. It can be small things, it can be large things, but take the time to thank everyone around you for the things that they have brought to your life that are of value to you. Be that in your place of business, be that in your interpersonal relationships, uh, be that in your home with your family. 
And if you are in a situation, for example, say at a technical conference or a user group where there are people that you don't know and there are people who are, are not like you in one way or another, say hello. You don't need to go any further than that. Just say hello. Acknowledge their presence. If they want to chat, great. But again, make sure that they feel welcome and that it is acknowledged that they are there and a part of your experience. And that gives you the opportunity to engage in, again, more useful dialogues, deeper conversations, deeper explorations of these topics, and to enhance your own understanding and your own learning. And I hope today that what I've demonstrated is that our greatest privilege as those of us who are able to do more because of the things that we were born with that mean we uh, get stuff that other people don't get. Our greatest privilege is to be able to give back to our communities. Some of us approach our role as technologists with great strength and with the backing of great experiences and great privilege. And it is not having privilege that defines us. It's what we do with that privilege that is what makes us what we are. And I hope that I have amply demonstrated today that not only a sense of fair play and meritocracy that we would actually like to create is important here, but also the importance of creating uh, a community that is welcoming and inclusive because it benefits each of us as individuals. And that is all of my presentation material. So I'm going to advance the slides so that folks can read the resources slide if they'd like. And I'm going to go ahead and take some Q&A. So moment while I enjoy this lovely web interface. Lovely web interface is not responsive. Moment. Oh, excellent. Here we go. All right, question. How do you respond to women who say that there is no problem, that they do not want to be identified as women in technology, and that they view any diversity program as preferential treatment which makes their life harder? Uh, this is a really good question, and this is a tough one. Um, I guess, um, wow, I don't even want to think about how recently it was. I would have been one of these women not too long ago. I would have said there is no problem. Um, these people who are saying that there's a women in technology problem are, are I respect their experience, but that hasn't been my experience, and I don't want to be singled out, and I don't want a big deal made about my gender. Um, this makes life harder for me. And I think that that's a completely legitimate standpoint to hold. Um, I feel differently now because of the experiences, that I, the experiences that I have had, and I don't think that any of us can speak for another person or for another woman about what experience she has as a, tech, as a technologist. Um, but there's also a lot to be said for the fact that, again, our flawed system um, creates a lot of internalized misogyny. And uh, when our stories that we tell and the way that we construct our approach to the universe says that all things are just as they should be, um, it's really hard to challenge the notion that there is a, a problem, that our system is flawed. So I don't think I have a good answer to this question other than to say to these folks that you respect their perspective and where they're coming from and that your goal with a diversity program or any kind of outreach that helps to bring women or other underrepresented groups into the technology community is to make their life better and that you can agree to disagree on this as a, as a tactic, but that hopefully that you can all agree on the overall goal that having more people contributing to our future through working in technology is good and that if these programs help more people to come and join that conversation, then hopefully that's a positive outcome, even if one particular individual doesn't want to participate. So uh, that's the best I got. I hope it was helpful. Okay, moving on to the next question. Oh, I think that this is someone that I met the first time I gave this talk. This is great. Okay, question. Since SCALE, which is uh, an abbreviation for the SoCal Linux Expo, I found a book, Humble Inquiry, by a former professor of mine, Edgar Schein. 
Do you think there is a way to reframe check your privilege in a way that minimizes defensiveness by the recipient of the statement? Uh, that is an, that's an absolutely excellent question. Um, words matter. Words matter a lot. Uh, if words didn't matter a lot, we wouldn't be talking here about our biases and the stories that construct our social systems and the way we think about things and how it's framed in language. Um, I have taken to talking about privilege instead of using the word privilege as um, stuff that I get that nobody else does because I, um, stuff that I get that other people don't get because of who I am. And first and foremost, I try to frame it within my own experience and talking about the ways in which I have privilege, um, such as explored earlier in the presentation, being white, being heterosexual, et cetera. Um, and I think that when we tend to take that very loaded word privilege out of the discussion, at least at first, when we're in the process of creating useful dialogue, um, and just, you know, reframe it as things that some people have that some people don't have, and then actually take that, that lack of defensiveness as an opportunity to explore why some people have some things and why other people don't. Um, that tends to make people feel a lot more comfortable with the, uh, with the dialogue. Um, but I would never presume to uh, tell anybody to talk about uh, how, how anyone should speak about these topics. Um, I just found that I have met with more success not using the word privilege until I have found that the person that I'm having the conversation with really grokks the concept of privilege. And then when I say, yes, that is privilege, and they react very negatively, then we go back and have a dialogue about how, no, I have simply assigned a single word to the set of circumstances we were just addressing. And that's, that's a cool moment, right? Usually that's a teachable learning moment. So excellent. I will now move on to the next question. Question, uh, how about perspective instead of privilege? I like it, go forth. We can all say, start saying, check your perspective. I dig it. Thank you very much for the suggestion. All right. Next question. Can you say more about prioritizing diversity in hiring? I find that many places simply say we welcome everyone and leave it at that, and then wonder why they keep getting white male hires. Excellent question. Um, there are people who have done way better work on this than I have. Um, and have way more useful things to say than I do. Um, I highly recommend checking out uh, Ash Dryden's work, which is actually listed here in this smattering of resources section. Her website is ashdryden.com, and she has talked about uh, programming diversity, how we create more diverse works, workplaces instead of simply paying lip service to it. Um, I will take up one particular topic that I think is very important, and that is simply your marketing, and what does your marketing say to potential job applicants? Um, if your website ha is covered with uh, stock photos showing um, white men shaking each other's hands in a bunch of business meetings, then someone who is looking at your website wondering if they want to work there, if they don't see themselves as part of how you represent their environment, as part of how you represent your environment, they are less likely to want to work there. Um, and that is one way that we simply, like, we stop having diverse teams right off the bat because we show people that the environment which they come to, will, would come to is not in an environment for them. Um, and again, other people have done much better work on this topic. Um, check out Ash Dryden's work. Check out uh, modelviewculture.com for more ideas very much in these areas. Uh, and specifically, I believe human resources will be a topic in uh, the next issue of the magazine Model View Culture. So go and talk to those smarter people about their ideas. Okay, next question. Can you talk about language like tech guys? This always makes me feel invisible. Um, I absolutely 100% hear you. Um, and this is just a byproduct of the fact that at least I can't speak for other languages. I don't, uh, I keep, well, I know a couple, but let's just stick with English here for a minute. Um, English is not a language that has, has uh, gender in it. Like our, our, our plural 
for y'all basically is masculine, right? Hey, guys, um, because a group that is consisting of all men is guys and some men and women is guys and then, you know, just women is gals, presumably. And a lot of people, when they use the word, hey, guys, when they walk into a room, um, they feel like, they have just said a thing that is completely normal. And in fact, it is normal. That's the conventions of using the English language. And yet that is one of those things that's a microaggression. If you come into a room that is, uh, contains both men and women and you say, hey guys, it's very easy for the people in the room who are not guys to feel like you are not speaking to them. You do not exist. You are not actually an individual and your experience does not matter. Um, I solved this problem uh, because a, a very good friend of mine one time pointed out to me that saying, hey, guys, was not really the coolest thing to do. Um, I now just say humans. I say, hey, humans, good day, lovely humans, etc." And I very specifically use the word humans because it is so not what people are used to hearing that it's really easy for me to remember to say it. And it does double duty to remind folks that when we use terms like guys, or dudes to be generic and refer to the humans in the room, we're actually creating an environment that is exclusionary to people who are not guys or dudes. So um, I highly advocate that one, we start saying check your perspective, and instead of saying hi guys, say hi humans. Um, you will find that the people around you will do a double take, and then they'll really start thinking about what you said, and that can be the genesis for a really useful dialogue potentially uh, in your workplace. All right, next question. My goodness, everyone has lots of questions. That makes me feel quite good. All right. How do you deal with nitpicking in your minority, being called whiny, or told that you are difficult by one of the few people in your group? Um, I'm not 100% certain that I understand the full question, and I don't know if it's possible to ask for clarification from the person who submitted it. So what I will do is I will uh, address the part that I know that I understand. Um, how do I deal with it being called whiny? Um, well, first, I go and chill out a little bit and get over the fact that I feel hurt by being called whiny because it doesn't feel good to have somebody call you a name. Um, and it doesn't feel good to hear that something that you have brought up as a topic of concern is not considered to be important by the person hearing it. Um, and then after I get done with that part, uh, then I assess whether or not it is useful for me to re-engage this person in dialogue. Um, some people are either not at a place where they're ready to learn more about um, kind of how they're interacting with other human beings and where their self-awareness level is. Some people don't want to learn and never shall wish to learn. Uh, and some people, really just don't understand that they have done something to cause you harm uh, and that they were not being kind and gracious to you. And when I feel like I have good evidence that I'm interacting with a member of the third group, someone who just didn't understand that what they were saying was, was unkind and not gracious to me, um, after I've had a minute to kind of think about it and think about specifically why their statement was, uh, was hurtful or problematic for me, I'll go back and engage them in dialogue. I try and do it over a coffee, right? Human beings really, we work well when we break bread together, right? And, and, and have, a, have a meal. So I try to do that. And I say, you know, I know you didn't intend it this way, but when you told me that I was being whiny because I suggested that you should say hi humans instead of hi guys, what that made me feel was that you don't respect my opinions and views and that you don't value me as an individual or a participant in our, in our team, in our organization. And I know you never intended it that way, but when you dismiss my concerns as whining, that's the way it makes me feel. And since I know it was never your intention to make me feel like I was not valued and that my experiences were not important, I wanted to bring this information to you so that the next time this comes up, it gives you the opportunity to have something else to think about in the same topic area. And again, the, again those questions are all, the, there's questions. Those dialogues are also, real, those are never easy. And you just have to practice 
and you just try and have to get brave. And if you need to practice with your friends, you can practice with your friends. You can practice with me. Um, there are coaches who can help you deal with uh, uh, negotiation and who can help you deal with conflict, if that would be something that is useful to you. And finally, if you're not a person who's comfortable with conflict, that's okay. Um, if you find yourself in an environment where it's awful for you and people are not uh, treating you appropriately, if you have the economic means to do so, by all means, move on. And in fact, it's very well shown that people who work in environments that are not considered to be inclusive and which are not wel welcoming do move on immediately as soon as their economic circumstances allow them to do so. Um, and if it's possible to clarify the rest of your questions, I would love to be able to answer them, but that was the only part that I felt like I could answer effectively. All right, next question. Um, <clears throat> can you speak to tone policing as a response to raising some of these issues? Um, first, I'd like to define the term tone policing. Uh, tone policing is coming to someone and saying, that the message that they are sharing is a good one, but the way in which they have shared it is not appropriate, and they should have shared it in a different way. Um, typically, it's you should be nicer about this, or why this goes back into why are you so angry? When you're, you know, when you talk about this topic and you're really angry about it, no one's going to listen to you. Um, and tone policing is another way to shut down dialogue, and it's a way to shut down dialogue that it feels pretty comfortable to the people who are shutting down the dialogue because it's pretty well known that if someone's angry, you might not want to spend a lot of time with them and you may not listen to what they have to say. That is human nature. Um, but that's, that's also a very, it's not a very useful response, plain and simple, because the tone of voice that someone uses or anger or passion in their voice when they make a particular argument um, doesn't detract from the importance of their message or the truth that they may be telling. And if somebody points out to you that your reaction is tone policing, that's an excellent opportunity to sit back and say, I'm going to extract the message that this person is giving me from their tone. Do I agree with this message? If I agree with this message, then I should be supportive of this person um, in whatever way makes the most sense for me. And sometimes being supportive of that person may be simply just to listen to them. All right. Next question. Oh, so many humans. All right. Next. Is there any alternative term for the merit-based system that some open source projects work on whereby people who consistently submit get good patches get additional rights in the project, e.g. commit rights to the search repository. Um, wow, I'm trying to think of a good answer to this question. I don't know of a better term than meritocracy uh, to refer to the idea that as people submit more and more uh, high quality code to an open source software project, they get more privileges within that project, such as uh, commit rights or uh, potentially maintainership of a project. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything, um, but that's, a, I think that's a good topic for us to explore. So if anyone's tweeting and wants to ask people if they can think of a better way to frame that so that maybe we can get the word meritocracy um, out of our dialogue in much the same way that that wonderful company in San Francisco, whose name I am blanking on right now, got rid of their meritocracy welcome mat. Um, so maybe we can come up with, uh, with new words to use and a better way to frame our dialogue. All right, next. Okay, and it looks like this is our last question. Do you have any suggestions for a good way to acknowledge and unpack our privilege with conf when confronted with check your privilege, uh, especially avoiding becoming defensive? Okay, so the first thing to, to do when receiving feedback about yourself that is something that you don't like is to sit there and let that moment or however many moments you require wash over you where you feel hurt and upset and angry and why is this person saying these things to me and why are they being so unkind to me? That's a natural human reaction. That's going to happen to you. 
We'll allow it to happen. Breathe. Do not speak. Just absorb. If you need to say something at that point in the conversation, it is perfectly acceptable to say, give me a moment, I'm processing that. And when you feel like you've moved past that stage of, of hurt, right? You may still feel defensive, but when you move past that moment of feeling hurt because someone has suggested that you are not uh, as awesome as you would like to think of yourself as, and we all like to think we're awesome, right? Um, then the next thing to do is to ask yourself why someone is saying this particular thing to you. Why did somebody say, check your privilege? Um, and do you feel that there's any merit to that? So if someone says to me, trying to think of a, I'm trying to think of a good example that I've seen or one that I've used where I'm not talking about any of my friends because I would never talk about my friends during a webinar. And of course I'm drawing a blank, um, but that is okay. I can come up with something later. Again, the best way to acknowledge and unpack your privilege is experience that moment of defensiveness. It will happen to you. Let it wash over you. It is okay that that happens. It is perfectly acceptable to say that you're processing. Try to understand why someone said this to you. And if you really want to begin unpacking your privilege, say to the person who called you on it, I value that feedback because I want to be a person who is inclusive. I want to be a person who is learning more and appreciating other people's perspectives. Can you tell me why you said that I should check my privilege? And chances are, if you're feeling defensive, you already knew exactly why they said it. Because the only reason it hurts when someone tells us to check our privilege is we're suddenly confronted by the fact that we have it. Because if we didn't have it, that statement would never have hurt in the first place. And then use that as a seed to further examine other ways in which you're privileged and other ways in which you can be more self-aware. Okay. And... Folks, that is the last question of the evening. I want to thank everyone for participating. Oh, wait, there's another one. I fibbed. One last one. Um, how would you deal with a manager who has tried to put you in your place and you felt it was because of your gender? Um, this, is a, this is a very complex question. Uh, and it's a, it's a complex question because laws regarding employment differ from uh, region to region to region, and I don't know where... Uh, the person asking me this question is based. In general, um, if I am in a position where I feel like I have an unsupportive manager, my first goal is to understand if it, was, if it is possible to uh, form a better relationship. And part of that's being self-aware about ways in which I may not be meeting my manager's expectations. Um, and sometimes, uh, you are not meeting a manager's expectations simply because they either are overtly or subconsciously sexist. That is just a thing that happens. Um, if you are aware that the person that you are interacting with is not going to uh, have a more productive or useful dialogue with you, um, your best approach is to go to human resources uh, and talk to them about the situation in which you find yourself. That's another whole set of complexities um, because, uh, you know, if you're in a startup, most startups don't have a human resources department. Um, and human resources departments have um, different goals and objectives from company to company to company. So uh, this could be a whole other webinar topic. So I'm sorry to give you the lawyerly answer. It depends. Um, but it is worth your while to involve human resources. It is very important to document ways in which you felt that you were not properly treated and the time and the date that it happens and keep a running log of that information because it is, it is potentially important uh, should action uh, be brought against you, such as firing you, um, that you have documented ways in which you have performed and attempted to meet expectations. And clearly there was more in operation than simply your performance. Um, and last but not least, and I, and I hate to say this because it's so easy to say and so hard to do, leave. Um, go to a different team if you can be separated far enough from this person who's putting you in a difficult position, or leave the company entirely and get a new job when the economic circumstances um, allow you to do so, uh, because there is no point to spending your time in a workplace where you feel like you are not valued and that your management is not supportive, and in fact that your management is attempting to um, be harmful to you because of your gender. Okay, 
And that really is our last question. All right, folks, I would like to thank everyone for uh, attending today. And as Yasmina said, the uh, recording will be live in about 48 hours if you would like to share this information with anyone else. And uh, I appreciate you attending, and I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you in person at the OSCON conference in uh, mid-July in Portland, Oregon, my former hometown. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Leslie, for presenting an outstanding webcast for us all today, for sharing your experiences, your knowledge, and expertise with us. Folks that attended our webcast today, we thank you for attending and hope you benefited from it. And as we close out, we'd like to let you know of a couple things that we did push out to you in your group chat. So if you didn't open that group chat, open it before you leave. Some good information in there to save you some money. First of all, as you heard, Leslie will be speaking at O'Reilly's flagship conference. It's called OSCON in Portland, Oregon, July 20th to the 24th. We pushed out a link to you all as well as a code. Write this down. The code is WEBCAST. WEBCAST. It can save you 20% on your conference registration. So do take advantage of that if you're in the area. As well, we pushed out links to you all to save you some money on our video products today. So we do hope you take advantage of that as well. The code, the links, all there in that group chat. Folks, we really appreciate your time today. Leslie, thank you. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.